Well, um, I'm hoping that everyone can hear me and uh, perhaps I'll get a message if you can't. Um, welcome to uh, the webinar on the new disclosure rules. And uh, so welcome to everyone to this webinar. We have uh, quite a few people who are attending. I think um, it's well over 80 and uh, about uh, over 200 people have signed up for it. So I hope that you find it useful. So um, tonight we've got, um, in addition to myself, we've got uh, Matthew Hardcastle and Sandra Paul, the co-editors of, sorry, the co-writers, co-authors of Defending Suspects at Police Stations. And we're going to be talking tonight about the new disclosure rules um, uh, that have been published, the Attorney General's guidelines on disclosure, and also um, the new CPIA code of practice. Now, as I mentioned, we are the authors of Defending Suspects at Police Stations. I'm sure you've all got your copy, but if you don't, then uh, if you don't already have one, then you will be getting an email with um, a deal on uh, <clears throat> a special purchase price for those attending the webinar tonight. Now, this is the first of an occasional series of webinars that um, we're going to be putting on designed to keep uh, people like you, uh, defence lawyers, police station practitioners up to date with police station law and practice. Um, now, in addition to, to the webinars and in addition, of course, to the book, you can also keep abreast of developments by looking at the um, Defending Suspects at Police Stations webpage on the LAG website and also by subscribing to the journal Legal Action, uh, where we write a police station update every April and October. So, so that the next one will be coming out in April 2021. So I'm just going to share a screen with you. Um, just bear with me a moment. So, um, <clears throat> as I say, what we're going to be doing is um, talking about the new disclosure rules from the Attorney General. And if I just turn the page, uh, there's a number of relevant documents that uh, we'll be referring to, and we've given you the, the link uh, of the various links to those various documents. So we're primarily going to be talking about the Attorney General guidelines on disclosure and the Criminal Procedure and Investigations Act Code of Practice, or the revised versions of both, both of which came into force at the end of December. Um, there's a few other documents that we will be making reference to. Uh, firstly, the Criminal Legal Aid Review, um, which concerns remuneration for pre-charge engagement. Uh, that consultation, that's a consultation at the moment, and that consultation ends in a week's time on the 25th of January. And what we'll be hearing is that although the um, new provisions on disclosure are in force now, uh, le the legal aid provisions um, have not yet been brought into force. Um, the other two documents referred to there, firstly, the College of Policing's approved professional practice. Um, this is a document which came out relatively recently on the extraction of digital data from, from personal devices. And that's um, uh, also up for consultation, although the consultation ends today. And then finally, we have a revised version of the Director's Guidance on Charging, uh, which came into force also on the 31st of December, 2020. So the way we're going to do this is that I'm going to start by providing an overview of the new guidelines and the uh, revised version of the code and um, putting them into a bit of context. And then I'm going to be followed by Matthew Hardcastle, who will look at some of the headline considerations in respect of the new arrangements. And then Sandra Paul, who's going to examine some of the strategic and tactical decisions for defence lawyers to consider uh, in respect of these new provisions. And then we'll leave time for uh, questions. So the plan is that we'll each talk for about 10 minutes or 10 minutes or so, uh, leaving sufficient time for questions and discussion. So given the number of people that are engaged with the webinar, can you please, well, first of all, 
uh, forgive us if we don't reach a question that you've posed. We'll try and deal with the, if you like, the most popular questions. But also, can you leave your video and your microphones off um, whilst we're going through the webinar? And we'll do the questions, as I say, through the chat function rather than um, asking you to speak orally. Okay, so a little bit about the background. So disclosure has been an issue throughout my professional career. And it was clear early on that the disclosure regime introduced by the Criminal Procedure and Investigations Act in 1996 was not working well. And in fact, there's a new book um, which came out just before Christmas called The Law of Disclosure, a perennial problem in criminal justice, edited by two of my former colleagues at the University of the West of England, Ed Johnston and Tom Smith. And there, the title of that book is very apt, a perennial problem. Disclosure has been and continues to be a perennial problem in criminal procedure. Now, disclosure was brought to the foreground once again um, in 2017 by the Mountcher investigation report conducted by Richard Horwell QC. And that was an investigation into the collapse of the trial of the officers involved in the Cardiff Three case, which you might know as R versus Paris Abdullahi and Miller, which was in fact a court of appeal decision back in 1993. Uh, now, if you don't know about that case, there's an excellent podcast series on BBC Sounds called Shreds. And if you haven't heard it, you and you listen to it, you'll find it truly shocking. In the same year, that's 2017, um, the, the CPS Inspectorate and Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary published a joint inspection of disclosure, which was far from flattering in terms of the way in which it was working in practice. And so those various events prompted the then Attorney General to conduct a review of disclosure, which in turn led to the revised Attorney General's guidelines on disclosure, which we're discussing tonight. So we'll have a, a brief outline of the new provisions um, in the guidelines and in the code. But before I go into those, I think it's important just to um, remind ourselves that the guidelines and the code are principally concerned with unused material, that is material that may be evidentially relevant, but which the prosecution do not intend to rely upon at trial. And therefore, the guidelines and the code do not provide a complete picture of all disclosure obligations. And it's always important to remember that. Um, but what is important, particularly, is that the Attorney General's guidelines introduce a new procedure called pre-trial engagement, pre-charge engagement, um, which in particular applies, as the name suggests, apply prior to charge. But just before we have a look at those, um, let's just remind ourselves of what other obligations of disclosure the police have at the investigative stage. Firstly, as we know, they have an obligation to inform an arrested person of the fact of and the grounds for an arrest, so section 28 of PACE. Secondly, if the person is then detained at the police station, then the police are un under an obligation to um, inform them of the grounds for that detention under section 37 subsection 4, although we know that uh, normally the custody officer simply trots out uh, the provision in section 37 for detention to secure or preserve evidence to obtain or to obtain evidence by questioning, which in my view is not enough, uh, but that's the standard practice, standard practice as we know. And then thirdly, there's an obligation in Code of Practice C, uh, paragraph 3.4b, which is an obli obligation to disclose to a suspect or their lawyer any documents and materials that are essential to challenging the lawfulness of the suspect's arrest or detention. Now we know, uh, and I'm sure this is your experience, that um, to the extent that this information, this kind of information is given, it's normally very minimal. And in particular, that final obligation to disclose documents and material which are essential to challenging the lawfulness of the arrest of detention is um, uh, mostly ignored. 
Now, the prosecution and indeed the defence, of course, have other disclosure obligations under the CPIA, common law and the criminal procedure rules. But generally, they apply only once criminal proceedings have been initiated. So what we're talking about tonight, particularly with free charge engagement, is um, a procedure which is relevant prior to any charge. So we'll have a look first at, um, uh, I'm going to look, sorry, at two things in particular from the guidelines and the code. The first is the disclosure management document, which I'll talk about very briefly because it's really relevant after the charge. Um, and we'll spend more time on the pre-trial engagement, which is a major innovation in the Attorney General guidelines. So the disclosure management document, um, as you can see there, is, it's, it's, um, a, a for, is now a, a sort of a formalized process, um, formalized, formalizing something that may or may not have happened in the past and now is required under the Attorney General guidelines. So <clears throat> this requires the, the prosecution, the police or prosecution to prepare a, a brief summary of the prosecution case and the general approach that's being taken in complying with the CPIA regime. It must include the, uh, a statement about the prosecutor's understanding of the defence case and also must set out an outline of the prosecutor's general approach to disclosure, which, as you can see, may include the lines of inquiry pursued by the police and prosecution, particularly those which may assist the defence, the timescale for disclosure, the method and extent of examination of digital material, any potential video footage, and any information about the credibility of prosecution witnesses. Now, in magistrate's court cases, the disclosure management document is, is effectively uh, discretionary in terms of uh, an obligation to provide it. Um, but if it is provided, then what the disclosure um, uh, guidelines from the Attorney General say is that if um, a case is charged on a full code test and a not guilty plea is, intent is anticipated, then the disclosure management document should be served in advance of the first hearing. Uh, and I have to suppress something of a wry smile when I say that because, um, well, well, we'll see whether that happens. In cases sent to the Crown Court for trial and a not guilty plea is anticipated, then the guidelines state that prosecutors are encouraged, that's the word used, are encouraged to serve it prior to the plea and trial directions hearing. So that's a disclosure management document, as I say, largely relevant post-charge. Post so let's go on to have a look at some um, pre-charge engagement. Now this is essentially a new concept, which in the words of the um, disclosure guidelines, is intended to assist prosecutors, investigators, suspects, and suspects legal representatives who wish to enter into discussions about an investigation at any time after the first PACE interview up until the commencement of criminal proceedings, which in effect means up until the person, the suspect is charged. And as you can see there, pre-charge engagement is intended to be a voluntary process and um, it, it may be um, initiated by the police or by the suspect or by the suspect's lawyer and it may be terminated at any time. And it's, it explicitly uh, states in the guidelines that pre-charge engagement does not refer to engagement between the parties to an investigation by way of a further pace interview. So this is an engagement process outside the context of formal police interviews. Now the guidelines set out what pre-charge engagement may involve. And I'll just go through these fairly briefly. Um, <clears throat> firstly, it may involve giving the suspect the opportunity to comment on any proposed further lines of investigation. Secondly, ascertaining whether the suspect can identify other, any other lines of inquiry. Asking whether the suspect is aware of or can provide access to digital material that has a bearing on the allegation. 
discussing ways to overcome barriers to obtaining potential evidence, such as um, uh, encryption keys, agreeing any keyword searches of digital material that the suspect would like carried out, obtaining a suspect's consent to access medical records, um, the suspect identifying and providing contact details of any potential witnesses, and then finally, oh, this is a final example because it's, these are not um, set in stone, these are what pre-charge engagement may involve, uh, clarifying when he, whether any expert or forensic evidence is agreed and if not, whether the suspect's representatives intend to instruct their own expert, including, as it says there, timescales. So, um, one of the things that we can, we can note about that is that although it, the, the label for this process is pre-charge engagement, which does suggest a two-way process, uh, many, if not most of the examples given are directed at information coming from the suspect or their lawyer. Uh, and I think that's something we'll, we'll talk about uh, later in the webinar. Um, but remember that this, these are in effect only examples of what pre-charge engagement may involve. Uh, and therefore defense lawyers shouldn't regard themselves as being limited to these eight points. Just a couple of other things before I hand over to, to Matthew. So um, firstly, the um, expectation is that pre-charge engagement will only be used in a, in a small number of cases between, the estimate is between one and 3%, or I think 5% at the outside. So the official expectation is that actually, the, although pre-charge engagement is gonna be a very important process, it's gonna be limited uh, to a relatively small number of cases. And as you can see, the projected annual cost is relatively small. As I said before, pre-charge engagement may be initiated by the investigator, by the police, prosecute the suspect's lawyer or the suspect themselves if they're not represented. Thirdly, remembering that pre-charge engagement is explicitly something that takes place outside the context of PACE interviews then strictly speaking, inferences under section 34 of the Criminal Justice and Public Order Act can't be drawn from failing to mention facts in the pre-charge engagement. But uh, as we we're gonna be talking about this later on, that has to be treated with the utmost care uh, because as we've seen in the past, the courts have taken quite a broad view of whether and when uh, a suspect can be expected to have mentioned relevant facts. Fourthly, and now I think, uh, I hope self-evidently, pre-charge engagement does, oh, sorry, uh, what I was gonna say is that pre-charge engagement, as we know, doesn't include PACE interviews themselves, but the fact that after, a, let's say, the first PACE interview, there is a process of pre-charge engagement does not prevent the police from conducting a further PACE interview. So, for example, they could conduct a further PACE interview, um, to ask questions about information that has been disclosed in pre-charge engagement. And then, um, uh, and very importantly, a full written signed record of pre-charge engagement discussions should be made. Uh, and that should include any key actions taken by the investigator or by the prosecutor. Uh, so that um, holds the potential to be a very important document and one that defense lawyers need to be very careful in terms of checking that it does indeed include the relevant parts of the pre-charge engagement that has taken place. And then finally, and um, Matthew's gonna talk a little bit more about this. Uh, as I mentioned before, there is a, a legal aid consultation on payment for defense lawyers to engage in pre-charge engagement. Uh, now this has not been, um, <laughs> coordinated with the, with the coming into force of the Attorney General guidelines because they came into force at the end of December, but uh, the fees for engaging in, in um, pre-charge engagement are still subject to this consultation. Um, so it's not yet known uh, when those will be brought into force. But as you can see there, uh, broadly speaking, 
um, they, they are going to be paid at police station advice and assistance rates, so they'll be outside of the fixed fee scheme and subject to a maximum of £273.75, subject to the possibility of an extension. So I think those are the, the major points I wanted to make by way of opening. Um, just a couple of initial thoughts about it. Uh, and one is that pre-charge engagement continues the trend which has been occurring over the past couple of decades of shifting the trial process from the courtroom into the police station. And this, I think, is just a further aspect of that. And I think something that occurs to me is that it further muddies the waters in terms of the point at which a custody officer should decide whether there is sufficient evidence to charge. Uh, because we know that um, custody officers don't necessarily make a charge decision or refer a case to um, the Crown Prosecution Service, even if there is sufficient evidence to charge and they've been given a lot of leeway in, in, the, in, in terms of uh, that obligation. Um, and so what we see is that, um, for example, after the first PACE interview, there may be sufficient evidence to charge, but it may be nevertheless that there could still be pre-charge engagement um, before any charge decision is made or before the case is referred to, the, to a Crown Prosecutor. So that's the, by way of introduction, and now I'm going to ask Matthew to come in and speak to you. Thank you, Ed. Um, I'm going to be going through a number of things um, relatively quickly. So I will start by just reminding everyone that the documents we refer to are going to be available um, on the uh, lag webpage. Around six months ago, the judgment in uh, the Crown against CB or the Crown against Barter James um, set out four issues of principle relating to the retention, copying, disclosure and deletion of digital information. That judgment features heavily in something we're going to move on to in a moment, which is the College of Policing's draft authorised professional practice on the extraction of digital data from personal devices. In my view, the CB judgment will also be material in the approach taken to pre-charge engagements, and in particular, for there to be a need for a properly identifiable basis for the line of inquiry. As you'll all remember, while that isn't dependent on formal evidence, there must be a reasonable foundation for the inquiry. In my view, for PCE, you can foresee this being applied where a suspect identifies further lines of inquiry, in particular digital material, which may have a bearing on the allegation and I can see the police questioning after a no comment interview and whether they have that sufficient grounding. The no comment interview itself should not preclude pre-charge engagement, but it is something that can limit the scope of it. And as Ed said, there is always that potential for a further paced interview. So I think this is gonna be an area where there is going to be a need um, for quite delicate negotiation. The College of Policing's uh, draft APP um, and the consultation closes today is going to be essential reading when the final version is published. Most relevant pre-charge engagement is the proposed framework for consent in relation to the acquisition of the device. The police must believe that the acquisition of data from the device is strictly necessary to satisfy a reasonable line of inquiry. Strict necessity is to be a high threshold test and consideration must be given to less intrusive means, for example, screenshots or viewing limited areas of the digital data. The APP applies for digital devices belonging to victims, witnesses and suspects. So suspects have the right to refuse permission unless under arrest or where alternative powers have been used to seize the device. Victims, witnesses and suspects may help identify reasonable lines of inquiry and or material on the advice on the device, sorry. The investigator will then need to apply that test of strict necessity. A suspect is also permitted to identify further methods to search the device, including suggesting search terms. Those have to be precise so that a reasonable and proportionate search can be undertaken and the search cannot be speculative. 
The APP also sets out in its fifth principle, something which is helpful. And it's the framework for handling data of offences which aren't under investigation. For example, um, messages which show that the uh, holder of the telephone is um, a habitual user of cannabis. In short, a proportionality approach is going to be taken and data will be disregarded unless it relates to serious harm. Serious harm isn't defined and investigators are told to use their professional judgment, albeit that some help may be found in the definition of section 93.4 of the Police Act 1997. So the use of violence, crime which relates in substantial financial gain, crime committed by a large number of persons in pursuit of a common purpose, or an offence for which a person who has attained the age of 21 with no previous convictions could reasonably be expected to be sentenced to an imprisonment, a term of imprisonment for three years or more. Amongst the, the wealth of material which has been released was the sixth edition of the Director's Guide on Charging. In the context of PCE, this has some important features. Paragraph 3.1 sets out the police responsibilities, and these include a responsibility to ensure that all lines of inquiry have been pursued, and those lines of inquiry which are outstanding are communicated to the prosecution at the time of the referral to the CPS. In Annex 4, this is supplemented by setting out the information required for a charging decision, and includes the current understanding of the defence case, the fact that reasonable lines of inquiry include those which may assist the defence, and for any lines of inquiry not pursued, a rationale for that decision. And again, through the prism of the PCE, you can see that a written and reasoned document on behalf of a suspect setting out lines of inquiry identified by or for the suspect is going to form a material part in that charging process. As Ed uh, highlighted, the funding position is something that is still being settled with the consultation uh, closing later this month. The consultation document unequivocally sets out that PC is not covered by any existing scheme and the proposal is to create a new unit of work. The proposal is that that work will not be means tested, but the sufficient benefit test will be satisfied where there is a written agreement between the parties, i.e. the CPS and the police, or CPS and or the police, and the suspect's legal representatives. And they have to set out in writing that pre-charge engagement may assist, that is, be sufficiently beneficial to the investigation. Now, at first blush, this may seem to put the prosecution in the driving seat, but I think when viewed in the round, it's not quite as restrictive as it first seems to be. If you can recall the Annex B examples of pre-charge engagement, they include a suspect providing access to digital material and digital keys. So I think arguably discussions about whether a suspect will provide access to their phone may be covered. Similarly, if a suspect proposes a line of inquiry and that is pursued, then I think that there is at the very least a tenable argument that that line of inquiry may assist the investigation and the pre-charge engagement ought to satisfy the sufficiently beneficial test that is required. If the police decide not to follow that line of inquiry, then as we saw earlier from the director's guidance on charging, they will need to be producing a written rationale of that decision. As Ed said, the impact assessment is predicated on this taking place in only around one to three percent of cases with an upper range of five percent. The proposed hourly rates are £51.28 for London and £47.45 for outside of London subject to an upper limit of £273.75. So we're talking at about five and a half hours work. Now, after that, providers will need to apply to the legal aid agency for an extension, but no further details have yet been given of that. So where does that leave us? In my view, in a case where there is to be pre-charge engagement, it leans towards there being a greater need to give an account under caution in some form. I take that view from the general direction of travel, which we have seen in the cases of the Crown against Lewis, the Crown against Green, and the Crown against Black, along with the tests that are going to be applied. Is there a properly identifiable foundation for an inquiry? And is the acquisition of particular data 
strictly necessary. But this is a new system. And on this topic, we don't all speak in one voice. And Sandra is just about to very eloquently explain to you why I'm completely wrong and why pre-charge engagement will be a useful tool even following a no comment interview. You might think it's, it's a little unusual for us to publicly take different positions and you're probably right. But it's new ground and we're all working as we're going. And we took the view that on balance, it was better to let you see both sides of the argument so that you can make the informed decision yourself. Now, Sandra, please, please be gentle. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that the um, potential limits and pitfalls um, are real. And I don't disagree with Matt on those, but I think there are also opportunities. And that when you look at um, the guidance that we're receiving, you look at what's coming down the line, what you have is what Ed described as an overall increase in transparency, and that just is necessarily a good thing for defence practitioners um, during the investigation stage. I think the first opportunity for me is the expectation of engagement. Um, we've all been worn down in the past by the inability to identify or speak to or get any meaningful information from the significant majority of police officers regarding what they are doing, why they're doing it, and what the timescales are. Uh, Pre-charge engagement, for me, provides a potential mechanism for that conversation. The officer is obliged to consider it. If you make an application to them for engagement, they have to respond to you in some way. Um, and I think that I'm approaching this as not so much um, pre-charge, but an opportunity to prevent charge. Um, worst case scenario, it's the starting pistol uh, for a trial if a charge is inevitable. Um, but there are opportunities there to influence whether there is a charge or not. Um, I think that secondly, and it's been spoken about already, that a two-way process is envisaged in this. Um, I think it's not just about information that our clients can provide. I see the examples that were given, um, but also for us to identify the, uh, the lines of inquiry that the officers ought to consider that point away from our clients. And it's obvious, it seems to me, when you read the whole um, guidance as, as one piece, that it's talking about speaking to people, for instance, you know, other government departments, um, other domestic bodies, overseas bodies, and that must mean it has something to do with also information that the client provides um, as part of pre-charge engagement. Moving on, I think that there is also an opportunity to have more visibility because there is an expectation uh, that the defence engage from a, um, an informed perspective, is what it calls it, in the guidance. And that means that you need to be provided with information regarding what the investigation, what the shape of the investigation is, to some extent, to allow you to engage in an informed way. And the guidance says very clearly the reason why that is important is so that the the defence aren't um, misguided as to the strength of the prosecution case. Um, and so you can expect that some information should be coming your way in order for you to engage effectively with this process. Um, I don't think that's necessarily going to come without asking. And so I view this as an opportunity really for us to shape how we engage with this um, and to create the expectation um, if we are going to be involved in pre-charge engagement, that that is on the basis of us being as informed as, a po as possible um, in order to do that. Um, I've already seen um, an email and I see um, the comment in the chat about the police doing this in a very routine way. Um, the guidance says that we're supposed to receive some information um, and you can, on the basis of that information, decide whether you are going to engage in this process. And so I would expect some disclosure uh, before I engaged in this process. 
Um, and as I said, we've got the opportunity to shape that. It's a matter of whether we use that um, to its uh, best potential. Um, and I think it's not going to come easy, but that's where it should be heading. Moving on, I think there's also some scope for us here as the defence. And I can see very clearly, and Ed showed us, the eight factors that, or the eight things that they anticipated that pre-charge engagement would include. And as Ed said, these are examples, but we're not limited by those matters. And there'll be other things that we want the police to do or ensure that the police do uh, in terms of the inquiries they are making and the way the investigation moves forward. And I was just thinking about what those might look like. And so, for instance, we want, maybe want to make sure that they've got information regarding the complainant's physical or mental health because you think it might affect um, the weight of the allegation. Um, I think probably um, it might also, that sort of information might get you a head start on what sort of expert you might need down the line. Um, if you wanted information about foreign or domestic convictions, cautions, other matters that might amount to reprehensible conduct, these are the sorts of things that you can identify. Um, sometimes there is, you know, for instance, documentation that's been used in, say, civil litigation um, abroad or is used in the family court here that you want to alert the police to because it might be relevant. There is an inconsistent statement that you're aware of in those proceedings. I can't go get it, but if I raise it as a reasonable line of inquiry, that might be something that the police need to do. Open source information. So you could go on and if you think about it, there are likely um, other things that would be important or relevant for the police to look at. Um, Matthew's already covered the issue regarding funding. I appreciate that it's not our job to help the police um, uh, build a case against our clients. But as I said, one of the ways in which I'm viewing this is about what I can do to prevent my client being charged in the first place. And I think it's a matter of um, finding the time if we are tall can being smart and being confident and proactive about what we can do now in practice how do we go about it and I think just a couple of points um, to think about in that space um, I know uh, when I read it uh, there was a, a part uh, which which reads as if the police can raise the prospect of pre-charge engagement uh, before or after the interview is what it actually says. And where that happens, should it happen, I anticipate that that might be a useful thing for you because what I have a chance to do is assess during the interview um, how the officer responds, whether I have received adequate disclosure, the, the, the the threat or not behind the questioning, whether the officer is in fact made up his or her mind already, are all relevant factors that might feed into my decision about whether um, I choose to engage in pre-charge engagement. Um, and of course, as we always do, we're gonna record that information really, really carefully. Because if at some point in the future there is some discussion about whether we should or should not have done that, and things move on and uh, they seek to draw some sort of inference. If it's not an inference, then something else um, adverse to my client regarding whether or not they should have engaged. My describing that and taking note of that at the beginning is going to be a very useful thing, perhaps some way down the line, uh, particularly if Matt's concern regarding failing to engage becoming something that is held against us. I would probably generally always want to appear interested at the prospect of pre-charge engagement, uh, pre-interview. As I said, it might make your life easier in terms of the way in which the police handle disclosure um, because they are wanting you to engage with that later. And again, you get to assess, is it timely? Is it honest? What do I make of this officer? Um, and you might want to invite the officer to ask you about it again at the end of the interview because it very much depends on how the interview goes. Um, as I said, you're always going to um, get, if the officers are applying 
um, the principle set out in Annex B, um, you're always going to get a point of contact uh, for the police, both for further representations, updates um, in that pre-charge stage. And of course, if that contact does not um, bear fruit, you have then a legitimate reason, it seems to me, to escalate matters to a senior officer or the CPS. And they shouldn't be surprised if they're not uh, responding, uh, given the, the, the structure that's been uh, put in place. Um, I think also to Ed's point really about the complexity of the role. Um, I think that making sure that the person who is attending the police station is authorized to engage in these conversations um, needs to be really a, a very clear decision um, that we make. We need to make it clear to the police either I can get into that or I can't. And so if we're sending somebody other than the person who has uh, conduct of that case, that's part of the brief or needs to become part of the brief, whether they are allowed to engage in those discussions or not. And if they're not, uh, they should be able to point the police to the person and provide details of who they should be speaking to if the police want to engage because what we need to make sure is that that information comes from the right legal representative and goes to the correct legal representative. And I guess further than that, even if the person who's attending is the lawyer with conduct of the case and has sufficient experience um, and knowledge to think about the case in the round about whether PCE is suitable, I think the other thing to consider is, is this the right time to do it at the end of an interview? Um, I think probably not. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that. There are, um, you know, is this going to delay the client's release from uh, custody um, or from the police station? Um, do you need to speak to a witness before you give uh, the police their details? Um, given that police stations continue to be one of the most cramped and dirty places um, on earth, when you've been waiting around for ages and you're dying to go to the loo, um, is this the best time to think about whether this is the right thing to engage in? And if so, how? So maybe a fresh eye, I think um, the next day might be more productive, but you know, each situation is going to be different. Um, there are formal and informal methods of engagement, um, but I think the important thing to remember is that that is always written down. And as Matt said, the letter of invitation or the email inviting can come from us as well as come from the police. But the formal process is the one that's most clearly articulated um, in the guidance and is the one that I think gives the most security for us. Um, and it gives you a really easy way then to say, yes, that's really interesting. May I see? The investigation management document. May I see um, what is going to be the disclosure management document at some point? Uh, but I think the, the most important thing, and it's a point that's been made already, is to make sure it's written down both what you're asked for and what you provide. Um, the disclosure is to be kept under review, um, and so there is an expectation that you will receive some information as has been said before, and it's to be kept under review. So you should get some information before you engage in pre-charge engagement and throughout that process. Um, and of course, what you're doing there is getting visibility. So if your client is charged at a later stage, you've seen the earliest draft of that document. You're able to see what has changed, what was missing, um, and identify things that may in fact become useful as that discussion and litigation proceeds in terms of disclosure. I'm talking too long, I've nearly finished. Um, I think that um, there's a lot to say about um, Annex A, but we don't have time to go through it in detail. Um, tactical considerations, and it's a point that's been raised already regarding whether you would need to, um, whether you would need to answer questions or provide some account and interview in order to be eligible for PCE. I don't know that that's true, and certainly the guidance says that an account is not, or failing to give an account is not a bar, um, and so that must be right. Uh, I guess the issue with um, not providing an account is what weight the police will add um, to the issues that you then raise. 
Um, I think that when you engage, you will have to give some information because you're approaching it in the same way as you would with any kind of disclosure or um, identifying a reasonable line of inquiry. You know, what is it? Why is it important? But I think there may be also very good reasons as to why you would tactically decide not to answer questions in the interview, um, but you might um, provide information as part of pre-charge um, engagement. Um, you know more about the evidence by then. You know, you have a client who's you know, subject to threat or modern slavery, um, or you, know, you might know more once you see that investigation management document. It won't protect you from an inference, I don't think, failing to answer questions, but then engaging. But I think that the way in which a tribunal sees that uh, failure to answer question might be modified. Um, either in them not getting a section 34 direction or in terms of the weight that a jury might give, given that you, you know, give the information later. Um, and so I think it's worth considering. Um, I don't know how this is going to pan out. I think that my view is always to be cautious um, when it comes to something like this. Um, it's much like providing an account and interview. If you're not sure, don't do it. Um, but there are opportunities here, I believe. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so we're going to move on to the questions now, and I think we've already got uh, a number of, of very good questions that have come through. Um, the, the, the first one that, that came through, and it's one that um, Sandra touched on very briefly, was whether South York's police use of PC is a matter of course at the end of a PACE interview is, is right or wrong. Um, and I think it's it's fair to say it's probably a clumsy interpretation of it. It's um, not the way that it was designed to be dealt with. I think it was designed to be dealt with um, in a slightly more structured way. And there should be that written engagement between officers, whether or not um, that is the way that it will work in practice is something we're all going to have to see. Um, but they they seem to be eager, um, albeit slightly misguided at the moment. For Ed and Sandra, we've had two questions that um, revolve around um, the same thing, which is what's your view on how PCE is going to fit in with the um, RUI and revised bail position? Shall I say something about that? <clears throat> um, for those of you um, who perhaps don't know, the, um, the Home Office has just published its, uh, well, what they call in the response to the consultation on pre-charge bail. And um, the aim uh, is to cut the use of RUI um, and increase the use of, of pre-charge bail. Um, we don't know when that's going to be legislated on, but um, it will require primary legislation. And the government is saying that um, it will attempt to fit it into the 2021 legislative program. So um, I suppose, <laughs> as with many of these things, we're not sure what, how it's going to have an impact. Um, I guess uh, because the specific question was whether it might be possible to use pre-charge engagement to get information about the uh, what the police are doing in an investigation and the timescales involved. Now, the examples given that we, we put up those eight examples um, in the uh, Attorney General guidelines on disclosure don't actually refer to timescales of an investigation. Uh, but I think there is certainly a, an argument to be made that in order for uh, a suspect and their lawyer to engage in pre-charge engagement, then they need some information on what it is that the police are proposing to do after the uh, uh, after the first or how after the person is released from custody uh, and before a charge a decision is made or, or the case is put to the crowd prosecution service for a charge decision um, because you know the argument would be well if you if the police don't disclose how they're intending to investigate this case, what kinds of evidence they are looking for, then how is it going to be possible for the defence to make a meaningful contribution, um, thinking about the examples uh, that, that are given 
um, in the Attorney General guidelines, which we put up earlier. So whilst I don't think uh, pre-charge engagement can be used simply to ask what the timescales are, I mean, there's no harm in asking, but I don't think the police would be obliged to necessarily answer that. I think that um, it would be possible to construct an argument around pre-charge engagement, which is, uh, which is uh, well, unless you can tell me how you're intending to investigate this, I can't know what kinds of information that, um, you, that would be useful to, to give to you at this point. I think just one other thing um, is that, and thinking about the South Yorkshire um, pr apparent practice in South Yorkshire, is that I'm sure that the police themselves are going to find it very difficult to work out how to use pre-charge engagement uh, and in particular how to differentiate between what kinds of things they should be covering in the PACE interviews and what kinds of things might be relevant in pre-charge engagement. You know, and I think that's, that's quite a complex process or may well be in any particular case a complex process. And for the most part, you know, as we know, police officers are used to working in accordance with fairly firm sort of rules and guidance, but um, are not so good at working out what to do when it's not clear what to do because you can't have guidance um, in relation to the circumstances of any particular case. Uh, and I think, uh, as Ma Matthew says, we, we're going to have to see how this turns out. Um, but yeah, so, so that's my thoughts about um, any impact on RUI and bail in particular. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Sandra. No, so I, I agree with what you said. And I think that one of the things that pre-charge engagement might do is give us that visibility. You know, that application that goes to the magistrate that says, uh, you know, we just need more time. And you're trying to understand what's been done during the intervening period or what's been achieved. I mean, if you've engaged on this basis, you have something fairly clear. And you now know that the officer should have that document and that should be something that they can append to an application to extend bail, for instance. Um, I think it's a visibility that I'm really excited about, the chance to ask for stuff. Right, so the, um, we've got a, a number of questions about um, the funding position, which um, I will open up to you both, but I will caveat quite heavily by saying the funding position isn't yet confirmed. We're going off the consultation document and um, it, it is a consultation that I think we would all encourage you to to respond to because it's going to be really important. There are parts in the consultation that just aren't particularly clear so there's been one question about the cost of experts and whether they're funded out of pre-charge engagement. The, um, the consultation is silent on that and um, the expectation may be that um, experts at the investigation stage would be funded um, in the way that they would be funded previously um, or it may be that it is part of the extension that you'd have to apply to the legal aid agency for um, but we get very much into the realms of, of supposition then but I think um, Ed Sandra if, if you have any views on that particular part of it then, um, then then please do jump in but otherwise one of the further questions on funding um, was whether doing the work was part of the scope or whether this um, this funding position looks like it is set just for framing it. I read it as the, it's the engagement that triggers it. So once you have, um, you know, it takes you time, doesn't it, to take the instructions, to check with the client, uh, to think about things in the round that I understood that the funding was going to do that, plus the communicating with the police. Um, as it were. Um, I don't know that it included kind of defence inquiries, if that's what was meant, um, as it were. It was about the facilitation of that communication with the police that it was intended to pay for. But these are all things that we can ask for clarification on by responding uh, to the consultation. I think it'd be really important for everybody on this call just, you know, the, the thing that's most pressing for you in the scheme as it stands now, just even if you just, you know, do the bit at the end, 
that says any other comments that, that make sure that that information is at the forefront of their minds. Yes, if I can just add to that, because I was just um, looking at the Home Office um, response to the consultation on pre-charge bail. And one of the things that came across very strongly was um, that they basically counted up who they'd had responses from. And the vast majority of responses were from uh, police organisations. And that then gives them the possibility of saying, well, look, the vast majority wanted to um, cut down um, the, uh, or rather to increase the time limits for bail. So, you know, they, of course, they will, they will use any argument they want to, but um, uh, it does make it important to, if, if the, the kind of questions which are coming up need to be put in a response to the consultation, and you've only got one week because the consultation ends on the, on the 25th of January. Uh, my, my, although, as Matthew says, the question of disbursements has not uh, been included in the consultation, my suspicion would be that not going to include disbursements. So I think it's, it's likely to be work done on engagement rather than either disbursements or, or any kind of defence investigative costs. Uh, that would be my feeling, but we'll have to wait and see what the, what the scheme finally looks like. Um, there was a question about whether um, legal aid is going to, for, for pre-charge engagement is going to be means tested. And I, if I remember correctly, it's pretty, it's, it's absolutely clear that the intention is that it will be uh, similar to the police station scheme so that it won't be means tested. That's, um, that's right. Yeah. So... So I think we have, we're just about running out of time, um, but I'm going to try and squeeze in, in one more question. Um, before I do, um, when this is finished, a recording of this, um, of this talk has been made and that alongside the documents that have been um, referred to will be available on the Legal Action Group webpage. But I think the... Um, the last question, and I apologise to the question answers uh, askers because I'm going to merge the two of them, um, was in respect of um, what appeal mechanism there may be um, and whether there needs to be a written document. Um, and before I hand over to Sandra Ned, I'll, I'll give my two pence worth, which is I think it's going to be really important to set all of this out in writing. This is going to be something that you want um, a very easily auditable trail for because when you think back to the director's guidance on charging and when the police will have to do that rationale for a decision not to follow lines of inquiry, if you are there and you are able to pull together very quickly the whole written history of the attempts to engage and there's been a decision not to, then that's something that is going to need to be addressed before the charging decision is made. Yeah, in, in terms of uh, whether there's any provision for appeal, I, I was just uh, looking at um, the Attorney General guidelines again, and I think I'm right in saying it doesn't mention that possibility. Um, it, it does say, as we have already said, that um, the pre-charge engagement should be recorded in writing, and that may provide the opportunity for a defence lawyer uh, for example, if that pre-charge engagement has been with the police as opposed to the prosecution to try to, if they've got that written record, um, to, to pursue that. Uh, remembering, of course, that's got to take place uh, before there is any charge, uh, because once a person has been charged, then pre-charge engagement or the formal um, process of pre-charge engagement comes to an end. Um, so I think the short answer is that there is no formal appeal mechanism if the defence lawyer is dissatisfied with either the level of pre-charge engagement that there, that there has been or, refusal, or a refusal to engage in it, um, or indeed if they're dissatisfied with the, um, the, the written agreement, although of course then if they're not satisfied with the written agreement they shouldn't signify their agreement to it. I think that's right, and I think um, we spoke briefly about escalation, uh, but don't. I think that an officer's conduct in this space is still going to be subject to the normal challenges in terms of professional discipline and professional standards. Um, and if there is a trial during the trial process, because if what they have done or failed to do has had an impact on uh, the, the, the evidence available for the case, 
um, or there is some issue about the admissibility of the evidence where they've gone off on a frolic of their own. Uh, these are still important points that we can raise at a later stage um, as well. And at worst, they're um, uh, speech points uh, regarding what uh, we try to achieve and what we try to contribute to as part of the process. So, um, but yes, it's one of the failures. There's no mechanism to ensure fair play um, where it. Well, I think that that draws us to a close. Um, on behalf of, of Ed and Sandra, thank you all very much for joining. Um, we hope to get the materials up in, well, before the end of the week. Uh, I'm not going to give anyone a time frame <laughs> that they can't meet without asking them first. Um, they'll be up as soon as we can, but hopefully before the end of the week. And thank you again for joining. Thank you. Thank you.